my loves, it's Ro. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to talk about a crazy, crazy case that happened right here in New Jersey, just a few miles down the road from my house, about a man who took the lives of three women, attacked four in a matter of less than three months, just 84 days, and a whole bunch of women solved this case. Not the police. The police were called. Did not believe them. And these girls cracked the case. Girl power. If you're interested in this crazy story that happened maybe five miles from my house, please keep watching. If you're new here, I'm so happy you stumbled on this video. My name is Ro. I am the author of a book called The Comeback Code, the founder of an organization called Strong Prison Wives and Families. Usually we talk about how I've been coaching prison wives and family members while sharing my own personal story since 2009. I don't glorify or glamorize prison or crime here, but I will teach you how to make the best out of your experience, this one-shot deal, to live above stigma, to beat statistics, and to put this all behind you in the rearview mirror. Every once in a while, I'll report on a true crime case that just sticks out to me, or if one of my subscribers or nonprofit members comes to me with a crazy case they were involved in or their loved one was involved in, I will report on it. And every once in a while, something will stick out to me, and I just have to share it with you guys. And this story is one of them. So really quick, before we get into the story, if you wanna see more of this pretty little face, make sure that you hit the subscribe button and to be notified as soon as I post a brand new video every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we go live sometimes on the days in between, make sure that you ring that little notification bell and also give this video a thumbs up if you like this content. I can't tell you how much I would appreciate it. So I found this story on NorthJersey.com. It's about a man who took the lives of three women and assaulted and ard a fourth woman who wound up getting away thank god because she was i think six months pregnant when this happened he actually used his phone for everything from how to find the women to directions home after he did what he did to these women and faster ways to do what he did Ugh. This article starts off by saying, after a crime, the victims and their families usually have to wait for the police to do their work and investigate and all of that stuff. And sometimes it's really, really slow. Well, for the women in this case, that was not good enough. Police did not crack this case. Women did. Amen. Girl power. These women outsmarted the killer. They found him and they stopped him in his tracks. Go girls. Khalil Wheeler Weaver was the killer in this case. He grew up in an area called Orange, New Jersey, which is right outside of the city of Newark. He came from a good family. They said that when you got to know him, although he was quiet and he didn't have any girlfriends and he didn't play any sports, he was really smart, but he was also really funny. He was the funniest person that they knew. As he graduated high school, he went off to Rutgers University where he was studying computer engineering. He didn't really go to parties there either. He kept to himself. He didn't have a lot of friends, but he also wasn't bullied. He just kind of maybe was what we would call a wallflower. They said when he did stand out, it was more for his nerdy style. He wore plaid buttoned up shirts all the way buttoned up. He would tuck those shirts into ironed khakis and then wear them with white Nikes. I think that's a cute nerdy style, but his friends told him, if you want to get girls, you have to wear the latest pair of Jordan. Your shirt has to match your sneakers and your hat. It's called street style, but there really wasn't anything street about this kid. His friend said you knew from the way that he dressed that he came from a conservative home and a conservative good family. His stepfather was a police detective in the town next to where he grew up. It's called East Orange. It's a very urban area, very bad area. Lots of crime happens in East Orange. And his uncle was a retired detective who worked for the Newark, New Jersey police force. By the time he was his late teens, like 18, 19 years old, he matured into a really good looking kid. He had these wide set, beautiful brown eyes. He had a charming smile. He started to DJ some parties and he saved up the money that he earned from DJing to buy himself a silver BMW. At this point, he was thriving. He met a friend named Richard Isaacs, who he became really close with. Richard Isaacs started dating Khalil Wheeler Weaver's roommate. 
At that point, he got a job as a security guard and he used to use his phone to research things like how to become a police detective, what to do to become a police officer. He probably wanted to follow in his father and his uncle's footsteps. But at the same time, he was also using his phone to search things like homemade poisons to kill people. Oh. When he was 20 years old, he met a 33-year-old woman named Tiffany Taylor through a friend. Tiffany grew up in the projects in Jersey City. Then she and her mother moved down to Florida where she went to school for a couple of years, but she wound up getting pregnant and moving back to New Jersey. After a couple of years of struggling, she wound up becoming a sex worker. During the time when she met Khalil, they used to hang out. She would drive to his parents' house in Orange where he lived. They would play video games and she would always call him youngin because she was 13 years older than him. He was obsessed with her. He was obsessed with her dreadlocks, with her tattoos, with the fact that she could drive her stick shift Volkswagen. He would always ask their mutual friends to hook them up. She just kept saying no because he was way too young for her. She just felt like they weren't on the same page. He was too immature. He started begging her to pay her to be intimate with him. She kept saying no, she didn't want to do it, but eventually times got tough and she said yes. She said that she would make that arrangement and do it for $200. At that point, she started a hustle where she would set it up, but then she would take the money and not do the act. She would get away because she said she just got so sick of being used by men at that point that she wanted to use them back. So they set up this date. She met him at his parents' house when they weren't home and she asked for the money up front. He gave her the $200 and she said, oh, I'll be right back. I left the condoms in my car. When she went out to the car with the money in hand, she took off. After she took his money, they never spoke again and her life started to go off in a crazy direction. Now insert a woman named Robin West. Robin grew up in West Philadelphia. She went to what they call in this article, a prison designed as a school. It was called Wordsworth Academy in Philadelphia. It was a place where kids with emotional and behavioral problems would be sent to. She met a woman named Bernicia Patterson. They were only 14 years old, but these girls became so close that they started calling each other things like sister and twin. Patterson said in this article, she's like, we acted alike, we looked alike. We were always together and blood couldn't even make us any closer. Closer. Robin West's father was a police officer and he was also a pastor and Robin kind of had this she kind of had a rebellious side. Her father said later that she was a very strong-willed person. If she put her mind to something, she would do it. Nothing or no one would stand in her way. She was adventurous and she always wanted to go on her own adventures. If she made up her mind that she wanted to do something, she was going to do it and no one was stopping her. She really didn't get along with her parents. She went through that normal teenager phase. So she moved out of her house when she was just 18 years old. They could track her moods by her photos on Facebook. So if she was kind of on a high, if she was up, she would dye her hair colors like mint green or platinum blonde. And when she was down, she would dye her hair jet black. She was 20 years old and she had great style. This style actually helped her get clients where she worked as an exotic dancer at Cheeks Lounge in Philadelphia. She would cry all the time because she was kind of conflicted. She knew that her parents would never accept her or her lifestyle, but that's what she liked to do. She liked to go out, she liked to go to clubs, she liked to dance, and her parents were church-going people. They didn't approve of her lifestyle. Robin West and Bernicia Brown were also street workers and they usually work the streets in Philadelphia, but one night in August of 2016, Bernicia Patterson suggested that the girls take a trip up to New Jersey. They wanted a change of scene, they wanted a change of clientele, they wanted to see if they could score some money. They stayed at a motel called Garden State Motor Lodge, which when I was in high school, cause I don't live very far from there, we used to call it the only hotel where you could rent rooms by the hour. And really, I don't think you were joking, but it's like a truck stop motel. Very seedy. It's known to be home to drug addicts and street workers and all of that stuff. I'm sorry I'm calling it that. I just don't know what to call it uh, that you, for YouTube guidelines. After a few nights of being at the motel, they ran out of cash. So they decided to go to an abandoned street with a lot of burned down buildings that's known to have this kind of traffic on it. And they got to work. Robin West didn't really know the ropes, so Bernicia was trying to kind of teach her. And the first car that rolled up on them was a silver sedan. And when the driver rolled down the window, the girls asked, which one do you want? And he pointed at Robin West. When she got in the car, Bernicia Patterson 
typed his license plate number into her cell phone. She saved it as a contact and she turned to the driver and said, be careful with my sister because I love her. Data that was extracted from his phone captured what happened next. He drove to an abandoned house in Orange, New Jersey, about two miles from his own house. He spent about an hour inside and he departed the house at about 1.27 a.m. 23 minutes later, a neighbor called the cops because the abandoned house was on fire. So the killer drove west on the highway. Then he turned around and he backtracked. He passed his own house, kept going, and he went back to the scene of the fire, to the scene of the crime, and he watched five different cities' fire departments fight that fire. It was so bad. While the house continued to burn, finally the killer asked his phone for directions to take him home. Ooh chills. The next day, Bernicia called the police and she reported Robin West missing and she was able to give the license plate number to the police and reported it as a silver BMW. It took two weeks for police investigators to discover that that body that was found in the building was in fact Robin West and they were only able to identify her through dental records because her body was just so badly destroyed. Ugh. I just had to go downstairs and make a coffee because I was getting a headache and take some more notes. So... Let's go on to the next person. Let's wipe our nose first. Okay. This is heavy, huh? Let me know what you think in the comments below. The next person is a woman named Joanne Brown, who was 33 years old. Joanne was born in Augusta, Maine, and her family moved her to Newark, New Jersey when she was five years old. She had six brothers and six sisters, and they all called her Billy Joe. Billy Joe was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when she was really young, but most of her friends and her loved ones would say she brought them so much joy. When she pulled herself out of her depressions, she was so full of life, so happy, it made people who loved her really, really close to her. She made a friend when she was young whose name was Amina Nobles. And Amina even said that. She said she had a lot of problems when she was young and she didn't talk to a lot of people, but she would open up to her about her issues and that's what made them get so close. Billy Joe wound up as she got older becoming a user and an exotic dancer and eventually started working the streets and everybody who loved her including Amina was really concerned for her because obviously that's a really dangerous line of work. In fact Amina would ask her sometimes don't you want to change? Don't you want better for yourself? She would acknowledge that she wanted to change but she would also say it was the only way she knew how to get money at this point. On October 22nd 2016 Joanne, Billy Joe, Brown, Amina Nobles, and a whole bunch of friends were hanging out at Popeye's in Newark, New Jersey. A man arrived around 1.16 p.m. and he chose Billy Joe, Joanne, to come with him on a date. Every single time that she would leave for a date, because obviously it's a very risky profession, she would call one of her friends when she got in the car. It was kind of a lifeline for her or anybody else in that profession. On this particular day, one of her friends was having an urgent situation, an emergency, and asked to borrow her phone. So she handed her phone off to the friend and she got in the car. When she got in the car, she asked to borrow the driver's phone and called Amina Nobles as her lifeline just to check in with. Them. That was at around 1.30 p.m. and cell phone towers were pinged by that phone right outside of Orange, New Jersey. They drove up to an abandoned house in Orange and the driver slash killer knew the place well because for 21 minutes before he even went to Popeye's, the GPS tracker on his cell phone showed him walking around and familiarizing himself, we guess, with this old abandoned house, obviously preparing for this moment. So what he did next was he wrapped her face in duct tape from eyes down and he wound up strangling her with her own jacket. He left her body on the landing of the stairs and walked out of the house around 3.03 p.m. Two minutes later, he arrived home. Four minutes after that, he searched his phone for the number that his victim had just called. He then proceeded to call the number. When Amina answered the phone, she said, is this London, which was Joanne Billy Joe Brown's stage name, and he was silent and hung up. She tried to call the number back three or four times, but there was no answer. The next day, she reported her friend missing because she knew that something was wrong. They spoke every single day, multiple times a day. A few weeks later, on December 5th, contractors were in that building looking and one of the guys stumbled on the body and he said, boss, I think we've got somebody sleeping in here. Okay, now this is where the story starts to get really good. Remember Tiffany Taylor, who the killer had a really big crush on and she stole his money. After she stole his money, 
and got away, they completely lost touch. Immediately after that, her life started to unravel. Her mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. They couldn't pay the medical bills. Eventually, they were evicted. She was still doing her hustle, but at the same time, she found a new hustle to help her make more money. She knew a drug addict who was living out of room 32 at the Ritz Motel in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Do all these details matter? I don't know, but that's what the article said. What he would do was he would pay her cash for her to borrow his car, he drove a burgundy Lincoln sedan. She would borrow this car and she would go around and she would score him drugs and in return he would pay her cash. All while this is going on, she continues to get texts from a stranger. But in her line of work, what she was doing that really wasn't too out of the ordinary, you're getting texts from strangers all the time. What was a little strange about this one was the fact that even when she got a new phone, this same man was still texting her and he kept asking to meet her for a date. Finally, she agreed to meet him on November 16th, 2016. The set price was $80. She borrowed the Lincoln from the drug addict at the hotel. She went to pick up this date at 7.51 p.m. Even though it was only 50 degrees outside, this guy was dressed like it was about to snow. He was wearing a ski mask that only showed his eyes. He was wearing a black hoodie with the hood pulled up and he was wearing gloves. But she said again that really in her line of work wasn't that uncommon for people to wanna hide their identity and to walk around wearing ski masks. So she picks him up, he gets in the car, he doesn't take off his ski mask. They drive a couple of miles and he asks her to pull over the car so that he could go to the bathroom, but winds up that that was just a hoax. So he gets out of the car and he must have hit her over the head because the next thing she remembers, she's waking up in the back seat of the car, duct tape over her mouth, hands handcuffed behind her back, and she's getting the four letter R word. He must have hit her over the head because she said when she woke up, she, her head was pounding with pain and she was begging him, please don't kill me, please don't kill me, I'm pregnant. He said, I know. He takes off the ski mask and he said, do I look familiar? Do you remember me? You took my money. At that point, she knew he was going to kill her right then and there. At some point during all of this, she bit her tongue and it was really bleeding bad. So between that and crying tears, the duct tape on her mouth had loosened a little bit. So she was able to talk and she was able to ask him, please loosen my handcuffs. They're so tight they hurt, please. And he did. And she said at that point, she knew that she had the upper hand. She said she always knew that she had the upper hand in their relationship because he was just a young, dumb kid that did dumb things. So she kept talking to him and she said, remember you texted me. My phone has our whole entire conversation on it. They're going to find you. My phone is back at the hotel room. So he was like, oh no, oh no, we have to go back and get it. And he got off of her and he got into the driver's seat. And for a hot minute, he became the victim. Nobody loves me. Nobody wants me. All I have to do is pay for sex. And he kept saying these weird things. Because Tiffany was double jointed, she was able to fold her thumb, I guess, I can't do it, but she was able to fold her thumb and get her hand out of the cuff. And what she had planned to do was, when he was driving, if he drove straight past the motel, she was gonna take the chain of the cuff, wrap it around his neck, and pull as hard as she could. She said she figured if the car crashed, she might die too, but she was prepared to do that in a fight to save her own life. Well, he didn't. He stopped at the motel. She slid her hand back into the cuffs. He took the duct tape off. He draped a jacket over her shoulders to hide the fact that her hands were in handcuffs and told her that she had a certain amount of minutes to get upstairs and to get her phone. So she ran upstairs and she banged on door number 32 at the hotel and the drug addict was in there that she was supposed to be out scoring drugs for, desperate for his fix, opens the door, she pushes herself in there, she slams the door shut as fast as she could, it dead bolts on its own. She opens the window, she shows him her hand out of the cuffs, and he ran away. She outsmarted him once, and he wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed, so she was gonna outsmart him again. And she texted him and she said, that's not my car, it's gonna be shown up as missing, you have the keys, bring the keys back to me now and I won't call the police. But in the meantime, she had already called the police. Security footage shows that he did in fact come back and he just dropped the key, he threw the keys there, and he had left. 
but the cops did come. She told them the whole story, everything from the original meeting down to the assault. They accused her of working the streets and told her that she was lucky that they weren't arresting her. So I'm gonna read this out of the article. At the trial, speaking to the jury, the assistant county prosecutor, Adam Wells, did not hide his contempt for this matter. The police treat her as a suspect. They do not take her seriously. They are dismissive. They act, frankly, disgraceful towards her. Talk about a nightmare. Seven days after Tiffany Taylor was assaulted and called the police and they didn't believe her, Khalil Wheeler Weaver killed again. This time it was a young college student named Sarah Butler. Sarah grew up in Montclair, New Jersey, which is right outside of Newark, New Jersey. She discovered dance when she was five years old. She was so talented that by the age of 15 and 16 years old, she was competing all over the country with large dance companies, and she competed in amateur night at the Apollo Theater. She didn't have the typical dancer body, and it took a lot of athleticism, and you had to be really in shape to do a lot of these dance moves. So she had to work really, really hard to get to where she was. And that was a family trait throughout. Their whole family was hard workers. She was the first one in her family to go to college, and she had to work really, really hard for that as well. She went to New Jersey City University, and she hated it. All of her roommates said she just couldn't stand it, but she wanted to put her head down and she wanted to get through it. She didn't really have a lot of friends. She wasn't dating and it was hard for her. She made herself a profile on a social media site that's used to find companionship called Tagged. She saw an account with the screen name Little Yacht Rock. Little Yacht Rock. Yacht like a boat. So she gets a message from this Little Yacht Rock that says, hey, you wanna make money? And then his next message is sex for money, question mark. So she responds, wow, well, how much money? He said, how much are you looking for? And she texts back $500. The next thing that she types is, you're not a serial killer, right, LMAO? He said, no. He then went on to say that he needed to leave for work, so he needed to meet soon. This was something that he did with a lot of these victims. He needed to meet soon, he needed to leave for work, and they made an appointment to meet, they made a spot to meet, but last second she chickened out. She got freaked out and she didn't show. Two days later, she reconsiders and she sends him a message that says, sorry about the other day, I got really nervous. I felt like an ass, but your voice and your pick don't seem like a match. He says, I'm a really cool guy when you get to know me. On November 22nd, 2016, the first day of Thanksgiving break, Sarah's mother drives up to the college to pick her up, brings her home. Later that evening, Sarah asks her mother to borrow the car. She got herself all ready. She put a beautiful red clip-in ponytail in and she leaves. She drives the minivan to the address that little yacht rock provided which was the same abandoned house in Orange where he had left his victim on the steps a couple of weeks before. Sarah Butler arrived at the house at 10.55 p.m. Little Yacht Rock got in the car. A Couple minutes later, a couple of miles down the road, they stopped at a 7-Eleven. He got out to buy three fire and ice condoms. Security footage captured him wearing the exact same outfit that he was wearing when he assaulted Tiffany Taylor just seven days before that. Black ski mask, black hoodie up, and black gloves. 10.07 p.m., they started driving up through a reservation that looked over this cliff with a beautiful view of New York City. It was a clear night. You could see the Empire State Building perfectly from whatever we are, 10 miles outside of New York City. On the opposite side of where they were at this reservation is a gorgeous wedding venue called High Lawn Pavilion. At the back end of this wedding venue, right where you meet the woods is a dumpster. He was really sloppy with this one. He killed her using his sweatpants, took the duct tape off of her mouth, left it right there in the minivan, dragged her out of the car all the way to the dumpster that was at the end of that property. He dragged her so sloppily that her heels actually left marks in the snow and hairs from that red ponytail were left out scattered all over the grounds and all he did was cover her body with some leaves and twigs and he got out of there so that night around 8 p.m 
Sarah Butler wasn't home yet and her mom started to worry. So she started calling friends and family and asking if anybody had seen Sarah. Everybody said no. By the next morning, Sarah's mother called the police and reported her daughter as missing. Four days later, a family friend spotted the minivan behind an old factory four miles away from Little Yacht Rock Khalil Weaver Wheeler's house. Why does his name have to be a tongue twister? They called the police and the family arrived. The police were scouring and looking for clues and they didn't notice, but her sister noticed pieces of the red weave sitting there next to the van, right next to a little blue trash can that her mother used to keep behind the driver's seat in the van. Her sister screamed. And at that point she realized her sister wasn't just missing, she was in serious danger. The police didn't find anything. They went on with their merry little investigation and the girls went home and decided to take matters into their own hands. They went into Sarah's laptop looking for clues and they discovered her tag profile. They saw that she had been chatting with this little yacht rock person and then they read those messages about wanting to make money for sex. So the girls went ahead and made a fake profile using a fake picture and found Little Yacht Rock. They sent him a thumbs up emoji. Now this is just days after the police investigation had started. These girls were at the police station giving statements and waiting for any news to come through. It was on November 26th, 2016. Standing in the Montclair police station, these girls get a text message back from Little Yacht Rock on Tagged. Freaky. He wanted to know if they wanted money for sex and he wanted them to do it really quickly because he had to leave for work. He said his real name was Taj and he was in a really big rush. All of it, the money, the proposition, being in a rush, all of it mirrored the exact messages that he was sending to Sarah Butler just a couple of days before she went missing. Eventually the girls had him call her and thinking really quickly, they decided to open up the camera on the phone, put him on speaker and record the whole entire call. Again, still standing inside the Montclair police station that's investigating their friend who's missing and her last correspondence was with this same person on a social media app. Crazy, genius, you decide. He said he wanted to meet right then, but the girls obviously needed a little bit more time so they could go inside and, and notify the police that this is going on. So thinking really quickly, they said, oh, I just have to wait for my sister to come home. I have a young baby sleeping, so as soon as she gets here with the car, she can stay with the baby and I will come meet you. And he agreed to that. So they set a time to meet at Panera in Montclair. The girls go inside and they explain to the police what's happening and they send out two detectives to go to Panera Bread to meet him. When the detectives confront him, he gave his real name, Khalil Wheeler, Weaver, and the cops said that they had no evidence, nothing to consider him a suspect, and they let him go. All at the same time, the Montclair police were able to use Sarah Butler's phone records to ping where she was. They found her up at that reservation by the Highland Pavilion, and finally, they recovered her body. Because of the girls and the interaction in Panera Bread, the police were able to hone in on Khalil. They made the arrest on December 6th, 2016, and immediately when he was arrested, all communications by Little Yacht Rock, Taj, and then another screen handle he had, Pumpkin Killer Ghost, all stopped permanently. At the murder trial, the Essex County prosecutor said, the women are all the real heroes in this case. So basically, Everything that this guy did was sloppy. It was a mess, thank God. He searched for how to kill people with bleach on his phone. When he met Robin West, he looked for directions home on his phone. When he went back to the murder scene to watch the house burning down, he had his phone on, sitting on the passenger seat right next to him. When Joanne Brown got in the car, she asked to use his phone to call her friend. When he attacked Tiffany Taylor and went all the way back to the Ritz Motel so she could get her phone, he created a whole trail because his phone was pinging GPS towers all around him. Prosecutors still took three years to investigate this case. Their evidence ranged from traditional canine searches to cutting edge tools like the Zephyr machine, which is a tool created by NASA that will melt a phone 
enable you to harvest cell phone data without needing the user's password. Even after all of that, police did not crack this case. Women did. Women who never investigated a murder in their whole entire life. Bernicia Peterson recorded his license plate. Joanne Brown's call to her friend Amina Nobles connected him and her to the spot where he picked her up and then later to the abandoned house where her body was found. And Sarah Butler's sister found the discarded hair extension as well as went into her computer and found those profiles, found him using his own methods to entrap women, they did it right back to him. These women risked their lives and thinking that he was hunting his next victim, these brilliant empowered women were actually hunting him, a serial killer. I would love to know what you guys think about this case, about these brilliant women and what they did in the comments below. You guys keep staying strong, keep loving strong, keep supporting one another through this journey because you're one day closer to it all being behind you. Lots of love from my heart to all of yours. I'll see you beautiful ladies and gentlemen in the next one. Bye guys. To an abandoned street, that's to abandoned street with, to an abandoned